I needed to hear that today. Yeah. Sure, I can tell others needed to hear that today, too. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Mm. No, it's been a particularly perplexing time for me. Two issues have been gnawing away at me for the past few weeks. The violence in our city and the sexual abuse in our church. And it was only after a conversation that I had with a friend this week that I began to see connections between the two. To be sure, they are both maddening and troubling issues that are directly affecting my life. The violence is happening right here in this neighborhood, folks, on this street. And I don't know about you, but I live here day in and day out. And the sex abuse crisis pervades this entire institution to which I have committed my life's work. And these two issues can make me feel helpless and inadequate because I don't know what to do about them. And quite frankly, they begin to eat away at my self-esteem. It's hard for me not to conclude that if only I were a better priest, I would know what to do about all of this. Well, in today's gospel, we hear the story of Jesus healing a man who is deaf and mute. If you want to follow along, we're going to be at Mark's gospel, chapter 7. The story begins at verse 31. Again, Jesus left the district of Tyre and went by way of Sidon to the Sea of Galilee into the district of the Decapolis. And people brought to him a deaf man who had a speech impediment. And they begged Jesus to lay his hand on him. Now, as a physical matter, as a medical matter, this is a very plausible scenario that someone who is deaf would also have a speech impediment. Most of us know that we need to hear before we can speak. And in many times, parents discover that their children have hearing problems because they're not speaking or they're not speaking properly. So it's very clear that this could be a very real scenario where a man who cannot hear also has a speech impediment. And really, Mark drives that home by describing the order in which these maladies are healed. Jesus takes the man aside and he heals them. And then Mark tells us at verse 35, and immediately first the man's ears were opened. Second, his speech impediment was removed. And third, he spoke plainly. The hearing had to be healed first before the speech impediment could be healed and the man could speak plainly. So again, from a physical perspective, this scenario all plays out as we would expect. But what if we were to approach this story from a more metaphoric or symbolic perspective, not just the physical perspective. What if we were to make a distinction between hearing and listening, and a distinction between talking 
and speaking. You see, because they are different things. Hearing is just the ability to hear the sounds, to take them in. Listening requires attentiveness and the ability to process what you're hearing and to interpret and make sense out of it. And the same thing can be said about talking and speaking. We all know folks who can just talk a lot of words. But are they saying anything? <laughs> Speaking requires that we communicate a message that is meaningful to another. We can all talk, but can we speak meaningfully? And really, if this is a story about the healing of our hearing so that we can listen, and the healing of our talking so that we can speak, then it teaches us very, something very significant about the relationship between listening and speaking. You see, because if there is no careful listening, there can be no meaningful speaking. Think about it this way. When we hear and learn about the mass shootings that occur and gun advocates say, we send our thoughts and prayers, there's a disconnect there. Those are words that don't really mean much because there's no true listening to what the concern and fear about that kind of violence is. And so when words are just simply spoken without any hearing, listening, they're not very meaningful. Consider our own bishops. How long has this sex abuse crisis been going on? And how often, in response to every time it comes up, our bishops say, well, we ask for forgiveness and healing. Words that have no meaning because there's no true listening, no true attentiveness to the situation. And so there's no meaningful speaking to us at all. You see, the story here is about we must have careful listening in order to have meaningful speaking. And look how Jesus accomplishes that. How does Jesus heal the hearing to become listening and the talking to become speaking? Well, he takes the man aside and he touches him and he prays, but he says to him out loud, epata, that is, be opened. And notice he doesn't say it to the man's ears or to the man's tongue. He says it to the man, be opened. And then the healing occurs. He hears, his speech impediment is removed, and he speaks plainly. Be opened. If we want our hearing to be listening, and we want our talking to be speaking, then we have to be open to the situation around us. And the way we are open to it is to be present to it and attentive to it. Then we will listen carefully and we will be able to speak meaningfully. Efata, be opened. That is how Jesus heals. 
Now, many of you may be aware that on Monday morning, we woke up to more devastating news of violence in our neighborhood. A young man who was apparently hacking rides to strangers was found shot and killed in his car right next door in front of Connection Point Church. Right now, there doesn't seem to be any connection to any of the other shootings in our neighborhood. But as I'm, far as I'm concerned, it's still too close for comfort. And I have to admit that when these things happen, I debate with myself on just how much I should talk about them publicly. On the one hand, if I don't say anything, then I'm lo I'll look like I'm clueless. But on the other, if I talk too much about them, then people might be afraid to come to church anymore. Well, like this sex abuse crisis, church, you all are already talking about these things. So my failure to talk about them isn't going to make them go away. But more importantly, if we can't speak truth to each other, how can we ever speak meaningfully to each other? Amen. Isn't that the disconnect in the sex abuse crisis? For years, the church has simply refused to talk about these things. And so now there's this huge disconnect between the hierarchy and the people because there's no meaningful conversation happening. And if, we fa if we're failing to communicate, if we're not speaking to each other meaningfully, then it must be because we're not listening carefully. We're not being attentive to the situation at hand. And that's when we need to hear Jesus' healing command. Epatha, be opened. We cannot expect to be healed of our maladies if we are not open to the truth. We cannot expect to speak meaningfully if we are not present and attentive to reality. I have to admit that it's really frustrating and debilitating for me not to know what to say or to do in light of what's happening in our city and our neighborhood. And I also have to admit that at times just saying, let's pray about this, rings as hollow to me as gun advocates who say our thoughts and prayers are with you, and bishops who say, let's ask for forgiveness and healing. I want more than hollow words that end up being a lot of empty talk. So how can we be healed by Jesus' powerful words, be opened? What does it mean to be opened to this situation? Well, for me, it means at least two things being honest, and being present. I cannot hope to listen carefully and to speak meaningfully if I am not open to the truth and I am not open to being present to the situation. I don't know what we can do about the violence in our neighborhood. There, I said it. But I do know that if we're not honest about it and we're not present to it, we'll never be part of the solution when it emerges. God can heal us of this scourge, but first he needs, he needs to heal our hearing and our talking so that they can be converted into listening and speaking. And for me, that has given a whole new meaning to our 90th anniversary this year. 
We have been part of this community for 90 years. And in our best years, we have been present to it. And if we want to be here for another 90 years, then we have to ensure that we are present to this neighborhood now in its time of need. We're going to begin advertising our final celebration for the 90th anniversary soon, our outdoor revival on Saturday, October 13th. We're bringing up Father Anthony Bozeman from New Orleans, and he and our choirs and liturgical dancers and our ministers are going to take over our block right on Mount Holly Street to praise and worship our God. And if we're going to convince Edmondson Village that St. Bernardines is serious about being present to this neighborhood, if we want them to know that we are listening carefully so that we can speak meaningfully, then we need to pack Mount Holly Street on October 13th. So I'm asking all of you to come and to bring your families and to bring your friends and to invite whomever you know to be here that day and take back our block for the glory and praise of our God. I know that there will always be room for me to be a better priest. But just because I don't know how to solve the problems of our city and our church, I'm not sure that makes me a bad priest. But I do know that if I want to speak meaningfully, I have to listen carefully. If I want to be part of the solution, then I have to be present to the problem. I know that I'm going to continue to trust in the providence of God. I'm going to believe in the power of God to heal. And I'm going to remain present to you and this community so that I can be part of the solution whenever it emerges. And today I pray that you will stand with me in always listening carefully so that we together can always speak meaningfully. Amen. Amen.